Greetings, growers from around the world. Jordan River here, back with more Growcast and maximum pest pressure. Today, we've got Matthew Gates on the line. You know him, you love him. He's the pest expert. We're doing Pestapalooza. Make sure to check out growcastpodcast.com slash classes. We're in your town and we're on Zoom now. That's right. You can attend the class via Zoom. Please come and join us for an amazing pest fest all day if you can make it live or join for the masterclass in the Learn and Burn Q&A via Zoom, any one of our classes. I'm so excited for this class, you guys. It's really, really good. And we go over some of the stuff today, but uh, you know how it is. We've only got so much time here on air. We're covering beneficial insects today. You're going to learn everything you need to know about Matthew Gates's top three biocontrols, how to apply them, how these beneficials behave in our garden, and when to use them and when not to use them. So I know you're going to love today's episode, but before we jump into it, quick shout out to AC Infinity. That's right. They make the best grow gear on the market. ACinfinity.com code GROWCAST15 saves you 10%. That is the maximum discount. We've had the code forever. We've been partners with AC Infinity for years. And why? It's because they make the best tents you can get your hands on. They make the best inline fans, the best oscillating fans. They make really, really great quality accessories like scissors, pots, ratchet hangers, and things like that. And now they also have lights. They've got the ion board and now the ion frame bar style. Really, really great stuff at AC Infinity. Get the whole grow kit you've been after. You know, you can get a 3x3 kit, a 5x5 kit. You know you want another one. Just go ahead and pop over there. Use code GROWCAST15 always at checkout for the max discount. And thank you for supporting us and AC Infinity. We love them so much. They make our favorite grow gear out there. I'm looking at two AC Infinity tents in my biodome, and you won't regret grabbing one. Use code GROWCAST15 at acinfinity.com. Thank you to AC Infinity. Okay, let's get into it with Matthew Gates. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to spread the show. Tell someone about Growcast. Get someone growing for the first time. It's the best thing you can do for us and for the community. And of course, see everything we're up to at growcastpodcast.com slash action. There you'll find the membership and the seeds and the classes like Pestapalooza, which we'll be discussing today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Growcast Podcast. I'm excited about today's episode. You guys know that uh, when it comes to growing, it's not just learning about plant biology. It's so much more. You have to put on a thousand different hats to be a successful gardener. And a large part of that is learning about bugs, IPM strategies, pest management, and insects. And uh, you guys know I got a whole class around it with a guy named Matthew Gates, who's on the line right now. What's up, Matthew? How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yes, sir. We just got back not too long ago from Pestapalooza, New York. Man, you killed it. What a great class. You did such a good job with the curriculum. Your performance was absolutely awesome. The students loved it. The all-day pest fest that is Pestapalooza. Thank you, man, and congrats on putting on an awesome class. I was so excited, and uh, I'm still reeling from the experience and the really excellent questions from a lot of the people who came by. It was a sharpening time for both of us, for me and the people who came in. Yeah, it was super, super cool, man. I, I really can't say enough good things. And, um, you know, we'll wrap about it more and everything, but I, I just want to thank you here on air and say, everybody, if you're interested, growcastpodcast.com slash classes. We have new dates up there. We're in SoCal. We're in Florida. We're coming to a town near you. I love learning about pests, Matthew. There's all these different facets to growing cannabis. And if you want to, you could dedicate your whole life and your whole field of study to just one of these things, right? Like I said, uh, plant nutrition or things like soil and biology in the soil. But man, insects, that's one of those ones, like I said, you could literally study your whole life and you'll never know everything when it comes to insects. It's so true. Like I was saying recently on another podcast, like over 90% of animals are insects or arthropods at least. That's crazy. I didn't know that. So yeah, they're so vast. They're so interesting. They can be so damaging, they can be so harmless, and they can be so beneficial. So it it really is a wild world when it comes to um, insects. And I'm just excited to be exploring this with you, man. You've been working on a few new videos, though. What subjects have you been cooking up behind the scenes for your Zenthanol YouTube channel? Yeah, so basically, one of my, the most long-standing series that I have on my channel 
is my pest primer series. And if you check out on Twitter or Instagram or uh, even on YouTube, you just type in or hashtag pest primer, all one word, then uh, you'll find various videos that I've made on all kinds of insects and also um, other kinds of pests that might be microbial or fungal or bacterial or something or a virus, for example, several viruses of cannabis, for example, I've talked about. And it's meant to be, in a lot of cases, it's meant to be short and like the bare minimum essentials that you need to know, like what does it look like, how to combat it, you know, what are some strengths, weaknesses, like a briefing, almost like that kind of a thing. But recently, I decided to make two pest primer videos, or maybe you could maybe consider them like an expansive version of these that go and deep dive a particular group. Usually, I do like a species, like the pea aphid or the hemp russet mite or whatever. But in this case, I decided to do the entire like scale insect family or, you know, suborder or whatever. And I'm also, I'm doing aphids and scale insects because actually, they evolved from a common ancestor. They're the most closely related in that of these two divergent lineages. And they're also basal to all of the piercing, like sap feeding insect group, the Hemitra. And so I just find it really fascinating and helpful to know a lot of this interesting information about how they evolved and mm -hmm. when they did and what are the genes that allow them to be so effective at feeding on plants and defeating their defenses so that you can know as a grower what might be products that would work well against them, what would be products that wouldn't. How to combat distinguishing them. Distinguishing the yeah. difference. Yeah, exactly. And then also maybe even ways you can like accentuate the defenses of your plants that are concerned with aphids or scale. If you 100%. know how they work. Yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense too. When you see these scale insects, you've talked about these, um, you know, we've discussed off air. These are the ones that kind of look like lumps on your plants, like a bump on your plant when it's attached to the side or the stalk, right? And aphids kind of have that appearance as well, you know? So it, I guess it kind of makes sense that um, they're closely related, those two insects. What are some, some interesting phenomenon or facts about how these insects behave? Well, here's one. So for scale insects, they get their name because they, they look like scales. They look like bumps. In fact, they're... Latin name or the the coxomorph. Coxo is from Greece. And from Greek, it means hey, watch berry. Bit. So it look, <laughs> looks like a little, you know, this little bump, a little berry or something. And they, um, the females, the the adult males practically never exist. They just reproduce asexually for the most part. And scale, so but scale insect females, back a long time ago, the adults looked like aphids a little bit, but the last common ancestors of all insects, of all scales, rather, the females are actually, they look just like the nymph, which is this little, like, uh, you know, like small domed insect that can move. Mm -hmm. Once they find a place to sit and eat, they stay there, and then they just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they just become this, like, bump on a log, literally. Mm -hmm. And basically, they look like they're young form, but they can still reproduce. And they just become these generators. They turn out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of little crawler nymphs that will then get blown on the wind or they'll settle elsewhere on the plant. A lot of people don't interact with them. I, I find that's kind of a lesser uh, encountered insect. Yes. But when they do come about, they kind of come about out of nowhere. They're kind of cryptic. They'll like stay on like the trunk of a plant and you might even not notice it if you're not looking for it. But then what happens is that you know, over a couple of months, you get hundreds more that establish. And then you're like, where did this come from? So that's why it's important to crop scout. Yeah, man, absolutely. That's that's uh, really interesting. They just basically fuse with the plant and then start pooping out babies. Is that, is that <laughs> what's happening with the scale insect? Yeah, basically, I guess a long time ago, like we're talking like early, early, like Carboniferous, when it's like swampy. And there's a bunch of like litter everywhere and everything's all wet and humid. Back back then, I guess it was uh, advantageous to just be a literal bump on the log and like, don't look at me. You know, I'm not moving around. I don't have to even fly. The thing that makes insects unique is that the first animals have powered flight and that allowed them to colonize the earth. And 
these scale insects went the opposite way. They got rid of their wings. And now all that energy that they would use to beat their wings, which takes a lot of uh, sugar, now they use that to uh, just make a bunch of babies. And they wouldn't have been able to do it without a bunch of, believe it or not, microbes that some of which used to associate with plants got into their bodies and then became their way to digest their food for them. So if it wasn't for these microbes in their bodies, they wouldn't be able to feed on the staff. It'd be, there'd be too much sugar and not enough amino acids. Ooh, There's bacteria that basically are able to digest the sugars and break down some of their waste, even the insects waste and other sorts of things from the plant and then convert those into the essential amino acids they need to survive. And so that's the only way something like an animal can eat on a purely clone sap diet. And this is true for aphids and all the other piercing mouth part insects, but because these were the first to do it, or some of the first that still exist anyways, that allowed them this provenance. And once flowering plants that were not very rugged or rough you know, like the primitive plants were, like the tree-like ferns and that kind of thing. Once flowering plants started evolving in the Cretaceous, all bets are off. Scale insects, aphids, they basically diverged with the plants as they diverged. And that's why you see a lot of times a big tendency, not always, but a big tendency for different species to become specialized on like one family or a couple of species in a genus or something like that. That is super fascinating, and it makes sense with the reproductive rates of aphids, right? This is one of their special abilities, one of their superpowers, it seems. Maybe it's this whole family, like you said, the scale family, is the ability to reproduce super, super fast. It's important to learn which ones of these are related to each other. Like you said, their their history, their behaviors, it really does help you gain a better understanding and give you a better chance in your garden as well. Really, really cool stuff, man. That's a cool video. I'll look out for it. Any other uh, aphid facts or scale facts before we get into uh, the meat of today's episode? How about the one that we learned at Testapalooza, which is that a lot of people know that uh, aphids have telescoping generations. That is, they're born pregnant. They're actually born pregnant when they're born. So it's actually two generations down uh, an aphid is born with, already kind of developing, I should say. And mothers will take in like information, what they see, what they feel, temperature and all that. And they will have an influence on how their progeny live. It's like getting a software patch. Like they download this info. So when they get born, they hit the ground running and they're going to be more adapted than their mothers were in in niche ways, in in like myriad niche ways that'll make them more effective. And this is an unbroken line for hundreds of millions of years of aphids that have done this very thing. So, yeah, that's what you're dealing with. That so is don't feel bad wild. if you get aphids. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I love about Pestapalooza, though. I had heard that aphids are born pregnant, right? But then there's always like a more interesting sublayer. I didn't know that they were born double pregnant, is what you're saying, two generations, and that they're actually transmitting information about their environment, about what they're feeding on, and getting them ready. Like you said, like, oh, we're feeding on cannabis. Like be extra ready, produce these enzymes, or maybe even have like slight changes in morphology to aid you in whatever we're feasting on. That's fucking wild. And that in more in-depth stuff, you, you never forget it, man. That's why I love what you, what you teach at Pestapalooza. It's so fucking cool. Join the Order of Cultivation, our membership program at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Marvel at the hundreds of hours of bonus content. Cash in on all the discounts, like discounts on Growcast Seeds, Dino Myco, Rain Science Grow Bags, 25% off all of our classes. That's right, 25% off of Pestapalooza. Our members get massive discounts. They get so much bonus content, and they get personal access to our member Discord. I'm in there. I'm hanging out in the voice chat. Come and smoke with us. Come and post in there. Get in on the grow challenges. We are a happy family over at the Order of Cultivation. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Jump in for the free seven-day trial. Watch all the Growcast TV you want. I know you're going to love it, and I would love to see you in our family, the Order of Cultivation. I'll see you there, everybody. Come and grow along with us. We would love to support you. You can be amongst positive, like-minded growers and connect with Gromies in your area. The Order of Cultivation, we're doing it big, and we are collectively achieving our mission 
of Overgrow. I'll see you there. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Let's get into the the meat and potatoes of today's episode. I wanted to talk to you about beneficial insects. This is something, again, that we do cover in the class, but we need to cover on air here, man, because there's a lot of questions around beneficial insects. Which ones do I choose? Who eats what? Is it useful to do it indoors at all? Is that a waste of time? How do you keep beneficials alive indoors? How do you attract beneficials outdoors? These are all the questions that I want to cover today and give people uh, an an overview and an understanding of applying these beneficial insects into their gardens. Does that sound good? Absolutely. I love talking about this. I want to start with a bit of a power ranking here. I would just love to hear your top three recommended predatory insects to apply to a cannabis garden. What do you like to see people apply that's really good to have in their garden? And how do these insects behave? What do they eat? And uh, why do we want them in our gardens? Well, I would give I would give the caveat that a lot of biocontrol usage has to be contextual. A lot of biocontrols are specialists. But in spite of that, that is why there are some biocontrols that are generalists that I love so much. If you have a certain kind of pest, a lot of times a specialist will do better than a generalist for a lot of, I think, obvious reasons. They're just more evolved to dealing with them. But if we're talking about things that you could buy that will affect like more than a couple of different species, my favorite would be, I think, Bouveria bassiana, which is a fungus. That's probably number one. That's the one I like to talk about the most. And it's an entomopathogenic pathogenic fungus, which means that it colonizes insects. And there's some research that shows that they can feed on or parasitize two-spot spider mites, for example. But, and also some of the microscopic mites, like russet mites and broad mites. But generally, they're insect pathogens, and they'll feed on things like white fly. They'll, they'll colonize root. I use them for rice root aphids. I use them, you can use them against scale insects like we were just talking about. You can use them against some beetles. You can use them against some caterpillars, especially ones that feed on the outside, on the foliage, and not inside your bud, like budworms. So there's all kinds of herbivorous insects that you can use the fungus on, both in the phylosphere and in the rhizosphere. So that's my number one, because it's such a broad spectrum fungus. It's such a wide application. Yeah, it's naturally found in, a, in many soils, cosmopolitan politically in the in the earth and despite all of that though i will say you know always be careful when you're applying products it doesn't mean you should apply anything willy-nilly or you know without thinking about anything i think that is not the best way not the best approach but generally speaking it's pretty harmless absolutely you know it's, it's not super disruptive and i really value that in a biocontrol it's a benign thing to apply to your garden right when you look at the spectrum of products available uh, all the way up to, you know, shit that's illegal in a lot of states like Pylon and Eagle 20 and this type of nonsense. I think Bavaria Bastiana is a great first thing to reach for because, A, like you said, it's natural. Um, it's not super toxic in the sense that we really care about, you know, to the environment, to us, to our pets. And it does do a good job eliminating a wide variety of pests. Now, how does that work? It colonizes these pests. So basically, these pests are infected with a spore that kind of takes over their body. What is, what is this, what does this Bavaria bassiana do to kill the insects that we don't like? Exactly. A lot of biocontrols that are microbes like BT, for example, a lot of times they'll be invading the insect of choice through their mouth because they're eating some sort of material Ah. that the, that the biocontrol is on. But with Bavaria bassiana, the spores will adhere to the the body outside externally or it'll get eaten inside either way it's going to be a bad time but (laughs) the fact that it also colonizes the the exterior and will literally develop it'll produce enzymes and things that will let it break down and basically melt through the body and then colonize it it's a type of cordyceps fungus so for people who are familiar with the infamy that are the cordyceps mushrooms then you can understand how uh, ferocious the Bouveria bastiana pathogen is. That is something straight out of Warhammer 40K. It sounds like it, it infects you and kills you. 
uh, it, the only thing left is to like, you know, reanimate your insect body as a zombie to do my bidding in my garden. That would be the only way it could get better because that sounds like straight out of science fiction, man. Yeah, that's uh, Necron IPM. Yes, you got it. <laughs> you got it. You, you nailed it. So uh, listen, you, you have this and you apply it to the soil, you spray it. That's all well and good. But what about something that patrols your garden, something living and flying? Uh, I guess, you know, fungi is living, but you know what I'm talking about, a real beneficial insect. What else do you recommend for the garden for a broad spectrum beneficial? For a patroller, for a broad spectrum, as broad as you can be, I like the phytoseed mite. So this will be like your ground forces. They're maybe not flying around, although I have some examples for that. But the reason why I like, for example, the t- what are called the type 3 predatory mites, or the type 3 phytoseidae, are the like Swirskii, Humerus, you mm-hmm. know, these mites. There are other ones that are more specialized, per similar to the type 1A. It's specialized only on two spots, spider mites. Californicus is, people, you know, have said different things, but on the McMurtry scale, it's a type 2A, 2B. So it feeds on pollen and it also feeds on spider mites and also maybe thrips and things like that, depending on a bunch of factors. So these cucumers, worst guy, these are type 3. They feed on things like, maybe they'll feed on some spider mites, but generally they'll feed on thrips and whitefly, mostly immature stages, so like eggs and larvae. Mm-hmm. They'll feed on those crawlers that scale insects produce. They'll feed on sometimes even some moth eggs, for example. Uh, although Ooh, I wouldn't count useful. on them as like a, Yes, yes, but I wouldn't count them on them uh, purely. But yeah, that's like one example. If you're already applying them, you know, you might get a little bit of that knock-on effect. But yeah, so I like them for this for this reason that they go after a lot of common. Oh, they also go after a lot of the microscopic mites. How could I forget broad mite and russet mite, which is of course very relevant cannabis Oof. cultivators the most important thing to keep away let's be honest if you're gonna i'm mean, we're gonna get to indoor beneficial insects in a second but if you're gonna take the time to try to keep something like this alive in like any garden especially like an indoor controlled garden though you want to keep alive something that's going to keep away the worst case scenario that's just my thoughts my opinion you know what i mean if i run into a thrip infestation or a spider mite infestation I've got options, but if you run into a broad mite or russet mite infestation, suddenly you're looking at a hard reset. You're looking at crop loss. It's a totally different situation. So I like the idea of a broad spectrum kind of generalist eater, and I definitely like the idea of eating broad mites and russet mites because those are the worst case scenario when it comes to an insect, in my opinion, those and root aphids. Yeah, it's, I, I completely agree. Like I'm constantly telling people like in a professional capacity, like with clients, like people ask a similar question, like what biocontrols? I want to get into biocontrols. In a lot of cases, people can't spray or don't want to spray. Right. Um, or it's this really onerous process um, if they want to get something approved or they had a plan and they got changed their plan. So I, I'm a huge supporter. And one thing that is really important to know is that these generalists, they eat pollen as well as bugs. And that's critical. Not all of these predators or biocontrols we're talking about are going to have what's called an alternative food source. Yeah. And so that means that you can, you can keep them alive in your crop. If you feed them pollen or you have a banker plant that produces pollen, which we can get into like ornamental peppers and things like that. I have a video on my channel that talks about research going on about ornamental pepper plants and how their flowers lasted longer and they produce more pollen or more flowers. So the, the mites, like cumerous, were able to keep around for a lot longer. Mm. You'd have to reapply more than you would normally. And, you know, I've encountered, I've talked to people, you know, I love the biocontrol comp- uh, area of uh, industry. I'm a huge fan, a big supporter. But, you know, I understand that their business models that they, they supply people with biocontrols. And so sometimes I've gotten pushback from people in that space that, like, Oh, well, if you feed them a bunch of pollen, they won't go to the pest. But when you look at the research, actually, they are way more reproductive on pollen. In my experience, with presence, absence, crop scouting, we found the population of observable events uh, quintuple, times five wow. when we applied uh, cattail pollen. And on top of that, uh, that's because the females don't have to go and hunt to make 
their eggs. They can just feed on the pollen. The proteins are important for their egg creation, and they lay a bunch of eggs. And when they encounter the thrips, or broad mites in this case, was the big one. We were fighting this in Gerbera daisies. They, they did really well. And they would retard a population uh, before it was able to go up. So we would have, we had like a year of data where we didn't do this and a year of data where we didn't, where we did. And the same seasonal outburst we get with broad mites, we had like a, a graphical interface that would show us our scouting data. And it was obvious. Uh, when we looked at all the information, we would usually get them like week 30, week 31, where it's really hot. And yeah. the population would shoot up and it would crash after we applied biocontrols. But we, we had the Squirsky already there at this level. The population was a little blip Whoa. and it didn't go high. Yeah. That is wild. So the, again, these this is the power of the generalist type three might, the Squirsky eye, the Cucumerus you talked about, uh, a couple in that category. I want to get into all of those details and, and get your third top three pests. But where are we ordering these mites? I know this is a question I get a lot. Do you have a recommended dealer? I think that in general, people, a lot of these biocontrol companies are, are really good. But I think that it's really important. Sometimes you can't be delivered to. Sometimes where you are, they don't have, they don't have a, a good logistical network for you. So I think it's important to be a little bit agnostic with biocontrol companies in general. That being said, what you really want to look for is uh, if you have somebody on the phone and you're not sure, you know, find out if they're a distributor or if they're like an insectary, if you're actually calling an insectary that where they produce the biocontrols, not just for the predatory mites, but for others. Because if they're generating them at house, in-house, there, the quality is likely to be much higher. It's going to be fresher. Exactly. The thing about... The thing about uh biocontrols is it's like coffee the fresher you can get it the better it's going to be every time this is a this is a living thing that you're dealing with so if it's just a middleman you're going to suffer versus someone who produces the stuff that that's absolutely right that being said i've had some good success like you said with you know the one that delivers the fastest or the closest right yeah so, yeah it depends it all depends I know the beneficial insectary was one that I was dealing with, but I think they might have sold. I don't know if they sold or not. They were acquired. You were right. Beneficial insectary was acquired. That's correct. Okay. By BioBest, I believe. Okay. But they produce the bugs still? Okay, so that's that's one. That's one option. But you say when you say, uh, you know, when you say remain agnostic, you're probably talking about go with one that's what, close to you? I would say this, if you've already, if you've got a selection and you already know all of them are primary producers, then just as Jordan adroitly articulates, you should then use other factors to tell which ones you want. Was one of them going to be quicker? Is one of them going to give you a deal? Is the price better? Right. I don't feel like one company over another generally has like, and sometimes they license the cultures to each other. Or maybe one only has the license to have one and then allows others to use them. There's a bunch of interesting things in the biocontrol space because it's very highly regulated. There's only a few like top producers for some of these things I've heard too. Yeah, you can't just like do it in your garage. <laughs> do you know that from experience? <laughs> yeah, people so like, what do I need to like cut out the biocontrol people? And I'm like, Five million dollars? Like, it's a <laughs> biotech startup. I don't know what to tell you. You have to have there's a lot of technical experience and know how. And there's great professionalism in the industry. So I have great respect for it. Well, I understand that. But also, shouldn't you be able to breed these in your how come I can't? How come I can't breed these in my garage and sell them to my members? Is that a really bad idea? Is something going to happen? Where it's like bad. <laughs> The problem is that you don't know what you're looking at most of the time because there's all these cryptic species like a Swirskii versus a Cucumerus. They look identical visually. I'm going to start mailing people two spotted spider mites on accident. I'm going to give it to everybody. Yeah, that, that <laughs> also is like a, another uh, consideration. Kidding, yeah. kidding. kidding. <laughs> APHIS will come after us. A-P-H-I-S. The, uh, yeah, they're the, the organizational body that restricts that kind Hold of Hold on. Wait a second. Are you telling me that the organizational body 
is one letter away from aphids. You don't have aphids, yeah. you have aphis. That's that's right. That's pure comedy. Aphis is up your ass because of your aphids. Jeez, man, this insect world is is it's its whole own thing. It's crazy. Oh man. Um let's see here. What are we Okay, third insect. All right, give me your t- this is the third of the top 3. What's your third recommendation? I think I know what you're going to say. What do you think you're going to say? I think you're going to say parasitoid wasp. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> ding ding ding. Got it. Um are these things pretty common in nature? I found some tiny little what looked like mini wasps flying around my garden. And they were kind of hanging out by the plants that were having pest pressure. And uh, tell me about these wasps, if that is what I was seeing or, or what you apply in your garden. And what are they doing? What are they killing? Yeah. So there's all kinds of parasitoid wasps. There, there's a quote out there that, that goes something like, because there's so many beetles out there that God must have an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> and that comes from the fact that there's that for a long time we thought the most the most species group of insects were the beetles. Like oh, there wow. were more beetles than any other kind of insect. Now that's being challenged by people who have done the math and have come out to say that there's actually more parasitoid wasps. <laughs> oh, that's boy. how many there are. I'm trying to put this in the right frame of reference here. Yeah, that's the nitty gritty right there. We've done the beetle math, okay? <laughs> it checks out. Yeah. So. So it seems like so there's so many because a lot of them are super duper specialized. So you got to know which what, what you're targeting, and you you can't just apply them for no reason. Oh. They're also kind of expensive, so you really don't want to do that. But a lot of the times people are using parasitoid wasps or aphids is a big one. Scale insect is another one, like mealybugs or some soft scale insects, or white flies another one. There's some wasps for those, and there's wasps for caterpillars so it depends again what you're looking for and which species and that kind of a thing i would say the primary thing people are thinking of are like aphidius irvi or aphidius colomani which are common for different kinds of aphids and the aphidius group actually irvi and colomani there are a few others but a lot of them go after not just one species but a lot of really common aphid species and when they do it's a very funny process. It's very interesting. They deposit an egg in the aphid, and then they also deposit what's called a poly DNA virus in their venom. And essentially, this virus goes on to prep the physiology of the aphid and oh. also suppress its immune system so that when the larva comes out, the larva isn't going to get like encapsulated and killed, and they can feed on the aphid and Essentially, the body will harden. We call these mummies. You might have seen these. I've totally seen this. You see a bunch of like husks, aphid husks all over a plant. Exactly. And the wasp will pupate and become an adult, and then it will chew its way out. And you can tell when they've successfully left because there'll be like a hole. But here's the second layer to that. There are hyperparasitic wasps out there. And hyperparasitoids, well, they go after parasitoid wasps, so they'll go and find one of these aphids that's already colonized, and they'll colonize that pupa, and then they will come out. And in some places, actually, it's been found that they can cause a significant negative effect on parasitoid success for the grower. And that's something that the biocontrol companies don't like to talk about either. Not to sound conspiratorial, but <laughs> you know, if you're, growing, if you're growing outdoor... Yeah, if you're growing outdoor, just consider that possibility. Man, that is pretty hardcore, I have to admit. I could I could see that like animated at scale with some heavy metal playing. That is insane. And you, you told me something interesting about parasitoid wasps, which is when you make their their killing pattern based around their reproduction instead of their feeding, their nutrition, suddenly you have a much more efficient killing machine because a mite is going to eat until it's full, right? But these wasps just kill and kill and kill. They can use that stinger over and over, no? Yeah, it's a different carrying, like a, it's a different capacity. You're right. There are advantages and disadvantages. With predators, you're right. They will eat until they're satiated and they won't eat anymore until they get hungry again, which they have a very small body and a lot of 
metabolism. So it does happen quickly, quickly enough. But with reproduction, the parasitoid wasps and other similar insects, they are so linked to the host that the host population goes up, the parasitoid population goes up. When the host population or the, or really the light, the stage of the life of the insect goes down. So like maybe they only parasitize the larval stage. Well, once all those larvae become adults, there's no larvae or there's less larvae, right? There's like a cycle and they're tied to this cycle pretty um, intrinsically. And so it becomes really important that you're able to produce enough because you're right, they will do this over and over again, but they do have a limit. And so you want to make sure that you have enough out there that they're going to overmatch the host population. It sounds like a good application for like an outdoor massive scale type thing. Like you said, if you have a massive aphid infestation, you just need to kind of release these things into your crop. It sounds like it would be an ideal specialist for a large scale infestation of that family. I feel like they do the best, as you say, and also when the crop is like perennial, I feel like is best. Now, cannabis is not usually perennial. Uh, we've, we can manipulate it so that it grows for many years, the same plant individually. But yeah, they generally, they flower and then they senesce afterwards. And if the population of the pest, of the target pest is low, it might be a lot more worth it than if it's like really un, like high. Like I wouldn't, it, it happens sometimes where people will get like a ton of aphids and because they weren't crop scouting or something and they look up like, well, what's a good aphid predator? Oh, these parasitoid wasps. Oh, okay, I'll buy those. Well. I feel like when you have like hundreds per plant, the pop, like you're going to have to buy so many right. that like it's it's kind of not worth it, right? Yeah, less for knockdown in general. These beneficial insects is my understanding, right? They work good as preventatives and like you said, maybe a small scale type infestation. But when it's really, really heavy pest pressure, I don't know what you can just release in your garden and expect to take care of that. That's a, that's a spray type situation usually is what I'm thinking. I agree. And even then, I, I mean, I probably wouldn't necessarily use like predators, but again, if you had like this in between space where it's like a lot, but not too many, and that's kind of a contextual question. It's a doctrinal question, I suppose. But yeah, like there are cases where I would use like lacewing larvae, which are super voracious over like a parasitoid wasp. But if you had the budget for it, you know, they have different advantages. So it's, it is valid to use both at the same time. And they don't really negatively affect each other too much, really. The lar the lacing larvae can't really feed on an on an aphid that gets hardened over and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's that's definitely an important logistical point. Okay, so let's get into some of the nuances here. I love those top three. I love the Bavaria Bastiana for just like a general all purpose fungal control. The type three mites, love the distinguishing between those. We're going to get into more in depth on, on feeding them and all of that. And then the parasitoid wasp, nice little curve ball there. Three very, very cool insects, again, that we cover deep in the class. But uh, let's talk about attracting these beneficials to our gardens. Let's talk about indoor uses and using them in conjunction with other IPM strategies. I think I want to start with indoor because we touched on it a little bit there and I want to go a little bit deeper. I want to start with just an honest Matthew Gates opinion. I know you've personally worked with a lot of gardens out there, so I'm just going to ask you straight up. Do you see people keeping beneficial insects around indoors successfully very often? Do you see people using them and applying them indoors with success? Do you even recommend someone who's a home grower listening to this show with a tent? You know, maybe he's got a five by five tent. He's got a lot of plants in there. Should they even think about this beneficial stuff or should they just not even bother? It's absolutely valid. It is definitely possible, is useful even to use biocontrols indoor. But a lot of people, I think the cultural conscious, when I when they think biocontrol, they think of like praying mantises that's at like the grocery <laughs> store. Yeah, for sure. That would be dope. Lady beetles. Yeah. Well, I mean, they have their place, but they're <laughs> generally not. The most of the pests that people are dealing with are not really going to be phased by mantids because <laughs> mantids won't go after spider mites. They're too small. A lot of the bad guys are really small. And the lady beetles, they typically go after aphids, yes, but 
like a lot of people have found, you know, I think that's where that comes from. Like they're like, oh, I just released Lady Beatles and I just got torn up by the fans or, you know, or I bought them and I didn't know that they were like expired or, you know what I mean? So like, that's why it's so important to set yourself up for success. Would you also say in that vein, do you think, and don't let me put words in your mouth, but do you think that maybe cultivation style might influence one way or another, where if you're a living soil grower who's already capable and already growing other plants, that maybe you're going to have a better style than if you're just in straight cocoa trying to keep these things around. You tell me yes or no. I think in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter. In a lot of cases, I think that what matters the most is that, well, this is maybe cultivation style. Uh, if you're spraying all the time, you're going to have to accommodate for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and depending on what you're applying, I don't think that it would work. You definitely have to accommodate the biocontrols carefully. You could do like a knockdown spray of something that's not too noxious, something that's safe, something that's like a contact that like like pyrethrin or something maybe that degrades very quickly into things that are also safe that you don't have to worry about. Because if you're spraying all the time, you're going to disrupt the biocontrols and probably kill them. And you're not going to reap the full benefits that you could have otherwise. Right. That does make sense. It's kind of one or the other. But looking at this in the context of I have to keep these beneficial insects alive now, uh, I, the only reason I was thinking maybe a bed is like, you know, get those ornamental peppers going. I guess you could throw them in cocoa pots as well, but you're going to have to feed these things for a long time, right? Although you did tell me once about a product you can buy that's like pollen bricks to feed your, were you the one who told me about that? Yeah, in the bottle, the cattail pollen. Yes, okay, that's what you were mentioning earlier, that cattail pollen. You could just buy that on its own is what you're saying. That's true, you could, but like your point about ornamental peppers, I think that, I guess what I want to say is that fundamentally, you can make it work, whether you're living soil or not. However, you know, there might be a mild positive that you might not get with indoor if you have it set up, like you're saying, in proximity. So, for example, I once worked with somebody who was trying to, they really wanted to do banker plants, but they didn't know how they wanted to implement them. And they've heard other people, maybe uh, peers and colleagues that people are even aware of, of mine, that, um, that maybe are not for biocontrol so much. They think that they're not implementable. But I don't think that's true. And one of the things that we came up with was growing the ornamental peppers from the research report, we grew them in a pot in soil and then we grew, and then we put it on a, like a wheeled carrier so they can just move it around wherever they had a hot spot. Damn. So it was kind of like a massive battalion of <laughs> predatory mites that you could just move to wherever the enemies were. <laughs> that was kind of cool. That is too funny. And I think that, I think that there's ways that a clever person could implement them creatively and have really good effect. And, and indeed they did. But if you had the ornamental peppers like introgressed in your, your bed, all the more better because the leaves are, bush, are, are bunching up on each other. If there's a little bit of that, you know, then the mites can travel directly from the flowers to the leaves to the other plants. And I think that could be like a, a highway. That's cool. I like that idea a lot. And those ornamental peppers are badass to grow. They look really great. I mean, there you go. They're ornamental. Looks like a firework going off in your garden. I really like those ornamental peppers. What about edible peppers? I guess some pepper plants attract pests. You can no? do edible. Do you, do you worry about Absolutely. attracting pests or no? So that's the other thing with bankers. Uh-huh. Definitely. Is a, it's like, uh, it's, it's not a panacea, right? It's, it's not like, um, you know, you apply the, the, the bankers and they don't get pests ever. Like peppers get pests, right? And some of those pests, some of those pests are shared with cannabis. Some of them are not. So, <laughs> so you have to really know what you're looking at. Like clover, you know, a lot of people like to apply clover. You can get clover mites, which are a spider mite that spins no silk, actually. And they're a very mild nuisance, but you can get them and they can totally feed on cannabis. And I got maybe those. Maybe certain aphids. That, yeah, ha exactly. that happened to me. That's why I do a mulch indoors instead of a living crop, which I would definitely do outdoors. 
I mean, it really depends, you guys. I like your honesty about the, not the mutual exclusiveness of spraying versus applying beneficial insects, but being conscious of that, right? Like if you're trying to do the outdoor permaculture thing, you're going to approach spraying way different than in a tent where it's just really easy to mix up a super gentle, natural pesticide. We have so many good spray options now. You know what I mean? Between, Nowadays. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's there's so many great natural pet safe, human safe insecticides out there that uh, I think it does make a lot of sense indoors. But that being said, this is Growcast. Like you, I, I also like Matthew Gates, you share this opinion. I want whoever's listening to this to garden the way they want to garden. If they want to turn their fucking tent into a permaculture, if they want to, you know, build it into the biodome or whatever, then uh, I'm here to help them succeed. And it sounds like you're saying it's doable. It's not too far out of the realm of possibility. You just got to plan for it, get something for them to feed on in there, maybe reapply every so often. And uh, and yeah, there you go. There's your your 24-7 security guards for your grow tent. I agree. It, it is a case where you can, you can render advantages and you can play the strength, like you're saying, regenerative or you know, growing in a raised bed versus growing in cocoa versus growing in any other kind of substrate, growing outdoors directly into the soil versus growing in, you know, pots and containers. You know, there's advantages and disadvantages to these. And there's a bunch of other factors to consider. But I think that it is it is the case that if you're growing, like if you're growing outdoor and you have a lot of land, make a banker, like make a bank of plants. That's where the term comes from. A lot of times people will grow like sweet alyssum, which has all these nectarous uh, florets. They're white. They come in white and yellow and all these other colors. You've probably seen them before in like, at like a, a store or something. They're great for the parasitoid wasps because the, the wasps as adults, they feed on like sugary nectar because that keeps them going. Oh, right? shit. It keeps them going, baby. That's their monster energy drink. Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're at their last stage of life. This is their dispersal stage. This is how they keep going as a life form, you know, making uh, their eggs into their host and, and continuing the cycle. So they don't need the proteins, the things from aphids. They need the sugar. So if you provide your biocontrols with these supplements, uh, all kinds of research shows how well this uh, improves their efficacy, improves their ability to hunt. It improves how many uh, successful parasitations happen. What? Uh, improves improves their longevity. So you're telling me that I need to I need to grow out these these plants to attract these wasps, and then what? Hit them with some extra sugary, some extra foop uh, sweetener to uh, to get that sugar level up to boost up my wasps into super soldiers. I just want to make sure I'm hearing this correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I wouldn't spray with sugar, but if you're no no if no, you no not spray, spray, but feed the soil right. Yeah, yeah. Increase, get those bricks levels up? Yeah, if you had a way to make the, I mean, I'm not sure how you would confirm it, but yes, if you had a, if you had a reliable way to increase the sugar content, because nectaries get depleted, but then they get refilled. So that's that production. It's like some plants so have that, that gutation really heavy, you know, and it just, yeah. I've, ha I've had some cultivars that just spit out that sap. If you, if you get that sap going, it's going to increase the ability of your wasps to protect your garden. Yeah. That's wild. And the same thing with the protein of the pollen on the ornamental plants. You know, you could plant one or two, or you can plant, you know, a bunch in like an outdoor field and have this like massive bank of beneficials. You'll have other things coming in and, but you have to scout those too. And you have to, you know, you'll have to control for pests that might be there as well. So you got to treat it as one thing. You can't treat them as separate entities, as a composite super organism. What do you recommend as far as kind of just good plants to have in your outdoor garden to support these types of insects and attract these types of insects? I like, I already mentioned the sweet alyssum. That's one that you'll hear a lot of people talk about. And if you're interested and curious, there's also a ton of research. Uh, people have looked um, into this for decades, and there's a lot of really great information about it. And it, it's sort of it's sort of unfortunate that I feel like it gets, you know, not ignored, but people aren't aware of it. So I definitely want to recommend people to look up more stuff. I have stuff on my YouTube channel as well, but 
Sweet alyssum is a big one. I already mentioned the the ornamental pepper plants. You could also use edible pepper plants. The reason the ornamentals are better is because the flowers last longer because they're not there for the fruit. They're there for the flowers. So all those floral characteristics of longevity and having more flowers means it's better for your mites that you pollen. Mm -hmm. But other ones, if you have as like a general rule, like these are going to be resources for the insect itself. So, and usually it's the adult. So like if you have hoverflies, which are these, sometimes called flower flies, they look a little bit like wasps that they can hover in place like a hummingbird. Yeah, that's not a wasp. That's a fly. And its larvae kind of looks like a caterpillar. And they will feed on aphids a lot of times. And the adults will feed on pollen and nectar. So if you have like, I don't know, some sort of plant that has a bunch of small little flowers with, with nectaries, they'll love that stuff. There's a lot of different plants that will kind of be in that realm. Like mustard plants are like this. And also what would be nice with mustard plants is that if you get a mustard plant, let's say, or uh, wheatgrass is very popular, you can cultivate aphids that won't feed on cannabis because they're a specialist on like, for example, mustard or wheatgrass, like the bird cherry oat aphid. And then you can release those parasitoid wasps that I was talking about and basically have this continuous generator Whoa. of parasitoid wasps. Yeah. Because if you get a big enough colony, it'll take them a, it'll take them a little while, like I was saying earlier, to go through them. Meanwhile, the rest of them will be patrolling elsewhere. That is an incredible, I guess not food source, like you're saying, it's more of a reproductive source. But uh, that that's crazy that you're like providing that starter fuel for the colony. That's great. And you don't have to worry about the aphids transferring over. I would be scared. Like, I know you're telling me they're specialists and they won't feed on the cannabis. But if I was seeing it in real time, I would be shocked, you know? Exactly. And, and that's the kind of thing where there will be aphids that are, and most of them are specialists, but there, there are aphids out there like the pea aphid and like the rice root aphid that we often deal with is a generalist and it feeds on a bunch of different plants, maybe not always very well, but they do. And so you got to be, you got to learn this information. It does seem scary. It's like an aphid is an aphid is an aphid, but they're not. And that's why learning that info, like in the aphid video I'm going to talk about in the future, once I've published it, I think that you guys will enjoy that because it allows you to kind of understand, like, is this really a threat? Let me consider this. What's the 3D chess, you know, situation? And I think it will allow you to perform better. But yeah, like when you just see them, you see an aphid and you think, oh, this is going to be a bad guy, but not for your cannabis. <laughs> That's, that is a whole different way of looking at it, man. I mean, listen, we have a huge list here. We didn't even get to all of the things that I wanted to cover today. Matthew, you are a great bank of knowledge. You are a great banker plant of knowledge. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to come and see us at Pestapalooza. We are doing this tour. We're in SoCal here at the end of the month, July 29th and 30th. We are in uh, Florida in October. Find all the dates at growcastpodcast.com slash classes and come and see us at this class. It's a two-hour deep dive masterclass, a one-hour Q&A and an after party. You can hang out with me, hang out with Matthew. There's special guests at every one. You learn so, so much. And uh, like I said, it's just, there's so much to cover that we left a whole hour for Q&A because we want to answer your questions. Matthew, that's what I struggle with the most is there's too much out there. You could, you know, put together endless amounts of, of, of content and courses. But if we go and we meet with these people and we ask them their questions at the end of our class, it really seems to spark um, some really good conversations and satisfy their thirst for knowledge. So, so I'm excited, man. And thank you, Matthew. Jordan, I know that you love coffee. And I think that you know enough about the history of coffee to know that many intellectuals would come to cafes yes, or their historical versions to talk and get stimulated in more than one way and talk about all kinds of important things. Yes. And I feel like the learn and burn is very much the same kind of thing. It's quickly becoming my favorite way to talk about heady concepts. And last time in Long Island, a lot of great questions, a lot of great conversations even helped me. It was very cool. And I look forward to seeing more of that very soon. Awesome, man. You rock and great job at Pestapalooza one. Everybody out there, stay tuned for Pestapalooza two. Oh, and did I mention you can attend via zoom everyone around the world? You can tune in for a lower ticket price. So growcastpodcast.com slash classes. 
thank you for all you do, Matthew. You rock. We'll see you soon, okay? I look forward to our mutual success. Have <laughs> yes, a good one, sir. Jordan. Me too. All right, everybody. You be safe out there, dear listener. We'll see you next time. Grow smarter. That's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to Matthew Gates. Again, stay tuned for Pestapalooza. See all our classes and events at growcastpodcast.com slash classes. That's right. You're going to want to join membership to get all the discounts and classes and seeds and hang out with me in the Discord server. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership is where you can find that. And of course, you can visit Growcast Seed Co. at growcastpodcast.com forward slash seed co. Find it all on the website, everybody. We've got some big things planned. We are at Legacy Michigan. That's an event here July 21st through the 23rd in Michigan. I'm going to be there. Growcast team is going to be there. Moderators are going to be there. Come and see us. We'll be passing out free seeds. Always pushing forward on our mission of overgrow. So that's where you can find us. And stay tuned because we're coming to a town near you. Breeder class is live. That's right. Breeder class. Again, growcastpodcast.com slash classes. We're in Virginia in September. So excited to see you. I hope you're doing amazing things in your garden. Stay tuned for more awesome content. I'm not going to stop. I love bringing the education here. I uh, appreciate you members so, so much. And all of you listeners as well, thank you for tuning into the show. You mean the world to me just by lending me your ears. It really does mean a lot to me. So I'll keep the content coming and you keep on gardening. Bye-bye, everybody. Do you like Growcast Podcast? Of course you do. Well, if you love this show, you're going to love A Slice of Cannabis, a show all about food and cannabis, hosted by our good friends and members, Port and the Rugged Gent. What's up, Rugged? Hey, everyone. Rugged Gent here. If you're all about cooking, great cuisine, and cannabis like I am, then you've got to come subscribe to A Slice of Cannabis. We're free to listen to on Spotify or any podcast app. So come and subscribe today. Tune in to hear from world-renowned members of the cannabis industry as we explore the beautiful relationship between the food we enjoy and the cannabis we love to consume. Season two has just kicked off, so come check it out and catch up on old episodes with Jordan, friends of Growcast, professional chefs, and much more. A Slice of Cannabis. Find us on Spotify or your favorite podcast app, and I'll see you there. A Slice of Cannabis, everyone. Go and subscribe now. Yeah, you can't just like do it in your garage.